Uh, bef before we start, uh, I just would like to uh, correct an answer that I gave earlier. Um, because I, I just had some feelings about, about the answer I gave and I'm not certain about it, so I just wanted to correct it. There was the question that you asked, Carol, about, um, about the Through the Mist book. Um, one of the things I'd like to say about the three set of Vajay Lee's books is that not everything in there is actually exactly the whole truth of what happens. Um, for example, in the life of Elysian, it describes my process of becoming at one with God, which was fairly accurate. And then it describes the process of my death, which was actually quite inaccurate at, in to at times. And while the, actual, uh, while the actual events that occurred sort of were as described in the life of Elysian, the, actual, the, the, the spirit was saying that I actually experienced a separation from God, if you like, from a separation of the overcloaking from God during my death, which, which wasn't actually a correct understanding of how divine love enters the soul. And so there, there was a few inaccuracies there. They're not, they're not major inaccuracies, that, but there's a few inaccuracies. With regard to the specific question that you asked was about, I think the lady's name was... Um, I can't remember the lady's name in the book, but in the gate of heaven there's this lady who lives on the earth and is in a sleep state and she does certain things with other spirits in the sleep state. And uh, part of those things that she was doing in the sleep state was she entered different states of existence, different spheres, if you like. And um, my feeling is that she actually <coughs> entered those states through the being loaned the energy to do so from other spirits. Um, this is something that happens quite often in the spirit world where let's say you have a friend who's in the first <coughs> sphere and you're in the third sphere. You can actually take the person in the first sphere to visit you in the third sphere for a short period of time depending on how much energy you can sort of loan them. There isn't an example of that actually in the Robert James Lee's books occurring uh, when um, Afra asked Myheen the question of like... Um, what, what does his home look like? And Mahain took Afra to his home, even though Afra was not in a condition to actually live in that location. And the way he did it was by loaning Afra the energy from himself, the love-based energy, putting a sort of an envelopment cocoon around him and actually taking him there, which he couldn't do for a long period of time and they had to go back. And my feeling is that, uh, that it may have also been the process that was by which this lady was able to be in some of the locations that her soul probably wasn't in the condition for her to be in. The other thing is that faith and love have a very large effect on where a person can go in the spirit world. And in fact, we can often go into states temporarily that are much greater than our current state, even here on earth. The way this happens is that uh, we actually, once we enter a state of faith, it raises our soul condition temporarily into a new location. And then once that faith disappears, uh, which it often does if we have different emotions that are confronted in the state, then we, go, we revert back to the original state where we would normally live. Does that make sense? And so um, often in the sleep state, in fact, in the sleep state, many of you are in a far greater condition of faith than you are here in your awake state. And in fact, I think many of you even know that, yes. um, that you're in a far greater <laughs> condition of faith in your sleep state than your awake state. <laughs> yeah, and what that does is the, the faith actually raises your condition and allows you to traverse more places in the spirit world than you would normally be able to in your current condition. And faith is a beautiful quality. It has, is a, so as I, I've mentioned it a few times before, but I, in fact I'm going to have a talk about faith at some point because it's one of these qualities that many people view as religious in nature but are actually quite a part of our day-to-day -day life. And, uh, and if we can exercise faith spiritually, we often can transcend certain places for large periods of time um, just because of the faith that gets us to that location. And then that's, in fact, that is why a lot of the healing that's on earth 
that occurs is called faith healing. And in fact, the reason why I healed a lot of people in the first century was because of their faith. Their faith raised their condition temporarily enough for me to connect with them and actually transfer <coughs> divine love into them due to their raised condition of faith in that moment. And sometimes that faith afterwards dropped away again because of the influences of their mind and their emotions and so they went back into their previous state and quite often uh, did things in that state that weren't harmonious with love. So this, this state of faith is a very, very important state and I feel that uh, the lady in question had quite a deal of faith in her sleep state in comparison to her awake state. And uh, as I've pointed out to you just now, um, the majority of you actually have a far greater degree of faith in your sleep state than you do in your awake state too. And so this intellectual mind we have has a lot of, spends a lot of its time trying to resolve questions of spirituality through its intellect rather than actually trusting our emotions. And it's that process of not trusting the actual emotion that causes us to actually get into this state of doubt or fear and those states of doubt or fear create the reality that we have here on earth. When we're in the spirit world, for example, all of you every single night are perfectly aware that there is a spirit world. <laughs> but how many of you really feel it day to day, you know what I mean? Like many of us don't really feel it day to day, do we? Or many of us feel in fact that oh, there might be and there might not be, but every single night every one of you go there. So, so obviously you have, are thoroughly convinced of it in your sleep state but you're not convinced of it in your awake state. Does that make sense? So, so this is something to bear in mind with all of these discussions. Many, many times what's happening here on earth is that we're in a totally different state because we don't have the awareness, the awareness or what some call the consciousness of truth hasn't entered us about certain conditions. And so in the sleep state that awareness has entered us because we're living in it. It's a lot easier to accept a spirit world when you're there than it is to accept a spirit world when you're not there. Which is, of course, where everybody goes, well, so as soon as you die, you'll accept the spirit world far greater <laughs> than you will <laughs> while you're alive, generally. Right? Unless you enter these states of faith and then grow in divine love and, and work through things that way. So in regard to the question, um, the lady exercised a lot of faith in her sleep state and was very, very empowered in a sleep state to be able to help others and I think also was loaned uh, energy from other spirits in different states in order to get to certain locations that she would not normally be able to get to. And a combination of those two things causes uh, quite a lot of beautiful things to happen in our life. So the truth is that when you exercise faith, as much faith as you have in your sleep state as you do in your awake state, then the same things that happen in your sleep state will be available to you in your awake state. You'll sleep all the time. <laughs> You'll sleep all the time. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go back to some questions. Can we start perhaps with, with Monica? And um, Pete's got the mic there. So AJ, where you go when you sleep, if you like, for want of a better word, is that based on your con soul condition? So, for example, I've always queried, I was in a setting and there was a volcano and I was running away from did it. it so it's almost like the different spheres. You literally go to where, where you need to go to experience that emotion or to reflect back at you what's going on. Yes. So if you're, if you're having sex with someone in a dream, for example, are you literally <laughs> in the spirit world doing that? to reflect back at you what you need to feel, or if you're being chased by a bear or whatever. Is it all to <laughs> remind you, like, because I've experienced a lot recently where I'm waking up and I'm going, my gosh, I know what I need to work with now because yeah. it's so clearly reflected. But yeah. are they all real? Like, no, is it all no, really they're happening? not all real. Okay. Um, you want to answer? You can. It can be one of, of two things. One is that it is a real experience that's happening in your sleep state, and the other is that it is a creation to help you deal with an emotion in your awake state. And how do you know the difference and does it actually make any difference as long as you're feeling what the feeling is, if you know I, I don't think it makes a difference. Oh, I feel it makes a difference. Um, <laughs> the, 
I certainly know where, want to know whether if I'm dreaming about something compared to if it's actually happening myself. But the, the way to know the difference actually is that um, eventually you will know the difference completely, right? But, and, and actually when you pass, there will be this integration of your sleep state experiences into your normal life. You remember in the, the book, uh, Through the Mists, Afra goes through this process where he meets his mother and then he realises that actually he's known his mother all the way along and his mother yet died at his birth. And then he realised that actually he's been meeting up with his mother every night, <laughs> every time he went to sleep, right? And then he goes through these other realisations of her name, what her name was. He knew her name straight away. How did he know that? Because he'd been interacting with her for his past 30 or 40 years. So, so there was this integration process that occurred between the sleep and awake states. Does that make sense? Um, so you will know when you pass or when you're at one with God, whatever happens first, you will know which experiences were dreams and which experiences were actual awake, you know, sleep state when you're awake in the spirit world experiences. Uh, before then, you will feel them quite strongly as quite different to each other. I, I do that now. I can tell now more. Mm. And so all of them remember our law of attraction events, though. So every single thing that happens in your sleep state and every dream that you have is a law of attraction event in, help, in order to help you with your emotions. The difference between a dream and a sleep state experience is a dream, the dream is a... Is, a, is usually a fabrication of your own mind in order to assist you with emotions that you are not dealing with in your awake state. So like you might have a dream of say ha having sex with somebody and you wake up and you're feeling really sh ashamed. Right? So what's that telling you? That you're not dealing with some sexual shame in your awake state. Does that make sense? and you're ignoring that emotion and you're ignoring it and you might have a series of dreams. Some of you have a dreams every night where you're being chased by somebody. Mm. Right. Now if that's happening then you're obviously ignoring some fear that you have inside of yourself in your awake state. Right. And you'll find that once you deal with that fear that those dreams will also disappear. The dreams that occur regularly generally are not sleep state experiences. They are generally dreams in order to help you access your denied awake state emotions. Yeah. Does that yep, make sense? Okay. Yep, and um, Peter, and then if we can go across. A, a couple of talks back you were mentioning how once you get into a state of truth in your, um, in your life totally, that that is equivalent to uh, being in the third sphere of the spirit world when you pass. And I've been reading recently the, uh, th some of the Judas messages where he talks about the kind of uh, transformations that you go through when, you, when you're going through the spheres in the spirit world and what things you have to discover and realize, which are things that relate to being in the spirit world and wanting to do that. And... I did ask you once before, but it wasn't the right time. What, what are some of the, um, the signposts or characteristics or um, qualities of character that you need to develop um, as, as a, uh, on your journey towards divine love so that, you know, for example, once you move out, or once you're able to embrace this truth, then you, you've, you're in a second state, a second sphere condition of love and once you're in a state of truth you're in a third sphere and could you just give us a few clues on on uh, on that that you I'm actually feel? not going to Pete because okay. I'm going to address your emotion about why you asked the question oh, okay <laughs> you see what the reason why you're asking the question is because you're still wanting to get some intellectual resolution as to what the path is going to be in front of you you see most of us do this all the time what we're trying to do is plan our emotional journey and our journey towards God. And so instead of going through this beautiful joy of discovery process that you can actually experience, what we instead, because of some childhood fears, we instead want to have it quite well marked out, you know, like a road 
with little signposts along it saying, oh, you, you've reached the third sphere now, isn't that fantastic? Let's have a celebration then, you know what I mean? And you've reached the fourth sphere now, and isn't that fantastic? And, and the, you don't have to map it out in that much detail. But there is, <laughs> there is an emotion inside of yourself, and that emotion is an emotion inside of a lot of people, and that's this, uh, this desire to know where I'm going before I make the journey. And that's what self-reliance is all about. And what we want to get into is a state of God-reliance, which means dropping away or releasing, yeah, releasing the emotions that cause us to not be God-reliant. So is that, is that faith? Uh, faith is a part of it, but it's also learning how, to, learning how to love yourself and trust God so much that you know you're going to be on the journey just so long as you experience your emotions and you long for divine love, that everything's just going to happen exactly right. And also, we can't say specifically what's going to happen to you in a set of orderly events on Earth. The reason why is because you can actually, on Earth, deal with different sets of emotions that, in the spirit world, you may be less drawn into experiencing. So example, an example of that. Let's say, here on Earth, you start working through an emotion about death. Right? Now, obviously, in the spirit world, you won't have that emotion. Because <laughs> once you've died <laughs> right, and passed, yeah. whatever that emotion is, that it will be experienced right at that time because you've now died and passed. And so you're now not going to be afraid of death anymore. Does that make sense? So here on Earth, you're going to have to deal with that emotion. But once you pass in the spirit world, you're not going to have to deal with that emotion at all. Then there's other sets of emotions that um, you will have to deal with in the spirit world that uh, you can deal with here, right now. But in the spirit world, you might confront in the fifth sphere. One of those sets of emotions are things like, you know, meeting your soulmate and working through the masculine and feminine injuries that you have that avoid you, uh, avoid, that avoid the contact and eventual joining of the two halves of your soul. Now, you can start working through that here in the first sphere. If you meet your soulmate and you get together and start working through those emotions, Whereas many spirits in the spirit world don't e do that until they hit the fifth sphere. Does that make sense? Mm. And so if you can just trust things a lot more about what's going to ha happen in the future just by dealing with your emotions and trusting your law of attraction, you'll find that everything will come to you at the fastest possible way on earth that you can deal with it. Some of those things will be like fifth sphere or sixth sphere things that you learn and you'll mm. learn them now. And then other things you'll learn will be a third sphere thing that you, learn, that, you, that you didn't learn ages ago because you were pretty resistive to it. Does that make sense? Mm. So here on Earth, it's fairly pointless to outline what the progression is going to be step by step by step by step. And that's one of the reasons why Judas, in the, in the Hans Radek's messages, why Judas didn't spend very much time on it. He spent seven, seven lessons on that. And in the end, he said, when he got to the seventh sphere, he said, look, that's a state you don't even understand at the moment. It's pointless really me even talking about it. Right. So, like, what's the point of talking about something that a person who, who here on the earth wouldn't even understand it at that particular time? So, and between then and the other spheres, he did outline some lessons. But in the end, on earth, you can learn those lessons really early in your progression. So, it it really has little b benefit even knowing those lessons in the spirit world because you're not in the spirit world learning them, you're here on earth learning them. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So look at the underlying emotion, which is this desire to see a path. It's a bit like if you could think of your path ahead as a, as, as a, as a very dark night, all black, right? Most of us in that state would want to have some lights along the roadway even if it was those little ones that, you know, those little solar ones <laughs> dotted along. I've just put some along our driveway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that I can make my back way back up there, right? And uh, because we don't know what's on the side and we don't know what's safe and so forth. And really what we're doing is confronting quite a lot of emotions in that process. Confront them. When you confront them and release them, you won't even have that feeling inside of you that you have to know in advance. And, uh, and as you release that feeling, it's a very freeing feeling because then you're living more like a child who doesn't care like where the next meal is even coming from, do, do they? Mm. It's going to come somehow. Like, so they just they don't care and that's what you will be like. You won't worry about that. It will mm. just happen as it happens. And you'll just trust the law of attraction bringing everything to you as, it, as it's needed. Okay. What, what's the main difference between faith and belief? 
Um, I would say belief is of the mind um, or of mostly so injured soul emotions, whereas faith is a totally different thing. Faith is the assured expectation of things that you hope for. In other words, this feeling inside of you that you know you'll be able to get there at some point in the future to in this new location. And, and as I mentioned uh, last talk, uh, in the mediumship talk we had last week, uh, people like you know, the Wright brothers had faith. They had faith that if they designed things a certain way with what they were learning about their mathematics and what they were learning about all these other principles, that if they designed this sort of wing in a certain way, what would happen is eventually if they had enough forward movement, there would be enough lift and eventually they'd get off the ground and they'd fly and they'd be anti-gravity. That's the faith that they had. No, not many people around them believed the word they were saying. Right? But they had enough faith to actually now put it into action and to live their lives by it until it became a reality. Does that make sense? Isn't that what we're doing listening to you? It's totally what you're doing listening to me. <laughs> totally. And this is a very, very powerful, powerful thing that, that, that we all do with all parts of our life, not just the spiritual part of our life. But it's exactly what you're doing. What you're doing is you, you don't know, you can't see the reality in front of you yet, and so you, you don't know it's going to happen, but there's a feeling in you that it might be true, right? That's what's connecting it. It might be true. In fact, you know, everything that's come up so far for me emotionally seems very true, so there's stronger feelings growing in me that it might be true. So what I do then is I then exercise faith that the future things might be true too. And I start walking towards that path, not knowing that they're true yet. And it's only when I start walking towards the path, doing the things that are required to be done, that I start actually coming to see that they're true. And eventually, the truth enters me so strongly that I know for certain they're true. And that's the whole process of this path, if you like, to one with God. Once you are at one with God, you will know it all to be true. And there won't be much faith required anymore except faith about future truths. The fact is you've got all this truth that you've now already experienced up to that point. And once you get to the point where, you, where you're at that state of knowing that all of that was true, you will also have a lot of faith that there must be more truth. And you'll start seeking that. Can you see that? Like, you'll start seeking that. So, so that's really... And this is a process that happens in the human race constantly. This is where all new discoveries have come from. From faith. From, the, from ideas that people inside of themselves believed to be true and no one around them thought it was true, but they believed it to be true and they set out to prove it and because of their original <coughs> faith, they eventually finished up proving the truth of it. So belief must be important then to, to just say that belief, oh, you know, that's an intellectual thing mm -hmm. because they, they started with the belief. They, yes. So that's got to make... But when you think about it, you start with a belief, but there is also this emotion in you driving you. So this is where desire comes in. So with faith, there is always desire in it. So I could have an intellectual idea, you know, ah, oh, we can fly, right? As a, as a human race, we can fly, like, you know. Tele you, teleport. No, no, I mean in a, in a plane. This oh, was like 200 years ago. I'm there having this intellectual belief, right? We can fly, you know. We can have some kind of device that means I'm going to be able to fly. Or let's go a bit more, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. But, but how much drive do I have inside of myself to actually prove that it's true? See, most of us postulate so many different things in the course of a day, but don't set out to actually live our life by what we've postulated and prove that it's true. Look at Edison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There were some people in history that have, and almost mm -hmm. every one of them were, was a leader in a field of a certain type. Mm -hmm. And almost every one of them finished up changing the course of human history. Right? So the truth is that every time I have an idea or a belief, there has to be some emotion in me that drives me to now make that a reality before it will actually become a reality for anyone else. <coughs> so if you look at what's happened in the, in, the, in, the, in the history of the human race, you can see that every single time there's been a person who's had an idea, they've also had this deep drive to actually make it become real. And when they've done that, and actually lived that life. And many of them have dropped everything. You think about what they've done. Many of them have dropped absolutely everything else in their life and made that one thing their focal point of their entire life. Mm. And, and it, yeah, other people ridicule them, thinking they're stupid and so forth. And yet, they are now the ones we look back on as the people that have changed the course of history. Just because 
they had a belief initially, an idea like that, but then they also had this thing called desire, this soul condition, a passion to actually see if this belief could be proven to be true. And actually they've gone ahead and done it and in the end proven it and now most of the human race benefit from it. So that's the difference between belief and faith. Mm. Belief is just an intellectual postulation about some kind of thing, some kind of intellectual philosophy that we could bandy back and forth between ourselves for days on end and never get anywhere and not change anything to do with the human race. Faith is a lot more, is a lot bigger than that. Faith is, there's a power problem, is there? Oh. There's, there's faith, and f but faith is totally different. Right? So faith, faith, is this, faith is this quality where now our passion and our desire is involved in these intellectual thoughts that we have and we set out to actually live them. And almost all changes that have happened to the human race, in particularly in modern times, have all been based around these principles. Yeah. So it, talk, it talks about in the messages that if you combine faith with um, sincere prayer, mm -hmm. then those two factors together are the, uh, the ingredients you need. They're the only essential ingredients you need to progress towards atonement with God. Yeah. And a willingness to experience their own emotions, of course. Faith and a sincere and sincere prayer. Remember, sincere prayer is all about having a longing, a sincere heartfelt longing in our heart for God. So when we have a sincere heartfelt longing in our heart, heart for God, what we're actually doing is also at that same moment being willing to experience all of our own emotions. So that's a side product of it, if you like. And the avenue of faith, believing that something I'm not currently experiencing can be a reality at some point in my future. Yep. Mm. That's very essential ingredients to your progression. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, if we can, Soraya, thanks. And if we can go across uh, there with that mic too, thank you. Hello. Um, I have a question about um, shamanism, actually. And we're mm -hmm. talking about spirit world and so on. Mm -hmm. um, before meeting uh, you, I, uh, I had a partner who was uh, involved in shamanism, and, and even though I've... Uh, been uh, searching for divine truth all my life, I thought, oh well, um, I'll see what this is like. I'd like to know what your idea of shamanism is and, and uh, what we actually did. I did a few courses and we did some journeys, shamanic journeys, mm -hmm. and um, I had a wonderful time going to, uh, diff having different experiences in the underworld mm -hmm. and, um, and in the upper worlds and mm -hmm. in this... Uh, well, they called them, I don't know whether they called them celestial realms, but um, that's what they felt like. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's my first question mm -hmm. uh, regarding that. Although I have a, a lot of feelings about um, certain people who call themselves shamans and the spirit influences around them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'd like to know what you think, please. Mm -hmm. Um, can I ask you first, like, <coughs> you, you've purposely left out what you think in all of that. Well, I didn't really think, I wanted to know what you thought. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason why you've left that out. You've had some fairly negative experiences too with different... I have, shows. yes, with certain people. I, my own personal experiences with my journeys were very, very beautiful and very positive. Yep. But my personal experiences with the number of shamans that I have met, the one, my previous partner actually, mm -hmm. um, when I started to learn some of, well, I started to imbibe some truths from your teachings, mm -hmm. I became a lot more sensitive to uh, spirit influences mm -hmm. and became aware that there were some very powerful um, lower uh, realm spirits, I think, that were around him mm -hmm. and were influencing my family. And uh, quite damaging, actually, especially mm -hmm. towards my children mm -hmm. and my son, Michael. Um, I, I really feel very strongly about that. And, and I, I actually became very suspicious of shamanism altogether and also um, just wondered about my own personal experiences of my journeys yep. 
and whether they were actually a whole process of self-deception uh, no, or what was actually going on, you know? What ha happened for you so personally was that you were connecting to some spirits who were in good condition and they were sort of feeding you a lot of images and also taking you on some out-of-body type experiences through the spirit world so you could get some feelings about the spirit world and what's going on in the spirit world in the lower regions of the spirit world, in the hells, what we'd call the hells. And then in the sort of, upper, when I say upper regions, they took you through the first sphere and a little bit into the second sphere and showed you some different experiences. Um, the second sphere experiences felt like celestial to you, right? And yeah, they did actually. Yeah. And then the, 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 the middle first sphere experiences felt very similar to different places here on earth. And then the lower sphere, sphere experiences were quite dark at times and you could see some things happening there that weren't too good in your experience. Um, yeah, pretty much. That uh, was not very nice feeling, actually. Yeah. I didn't really want to go any further down. Exactly, mm. yeah. So what they did was they, well, they were showing you through this experience, this out-of-body experience, the spirit world and, and some of the gradation, grad graduations of the spirit world that your soul, with a bit of help for their, for their energy, could actually be lifted to or actually could go into in the lower spheres so you could see the differences in condition. Now let's look at the shaman experience. So what, what I feel you were experiencing wasn't the shaman experience. What it was was just a normal out-of-body experience based on your soul condition and help from the spirits that are around you in the spirit world. The shaman experience is very similar to a lot of other overcloaking type experiences that are happening on earth today for lots of different types of religions and different, different types of movements. And that is the soul condition of the person attracts a group of spirits who are in the same the soul condition generally and those spirits then heavily manipulate uh, the person because they're very mediumistic into doing all sorts of things that they want them to do. Now many shamans are so called are looked up to <coughs> because they can do quite some quite metaphysically seemingly powerful things but they're actually the same kind of things you could do if you're in the, uh, in the first sphere of the spirit world. And so many of them are actually overcloaked by first fear spirits. Um, and this is why many people finish up having some quite negative experiences too uh, when they interact with shamans, if in quotations. These names that we give to people in different conditions on earth really don't matter much in the spirit world. All that's happening is a person on earth who's quite mediumistic and who's developed that mediumistic skill is being overcloaked by some spirits they can go out of body because of the help with that those spirits give them and they can experience many things and, and also therefore, like if I can go out of body, I can go and visit your home, can I not? Mm -hmm. And if I'm fully conscious of what's happening in the out of body in moment, I can actually describe your home to you although I've never visited it in the wake state. And you, you're going to think that's pretty amazing. But actually any first fear spirit can do that. They, in fact, they do do that. They go to your home, check it out, <laughs> and talk to a medium where that you go to and tell you about it. Do you know what I mean? Where you lost your keys last Friday. All of those kind of things. None of those experiences are anything to do with love or anything to do with higher development. But they are a lot to do with the metaphysical and how the spirit world works. So most shamans are very, very involved in the metaphysical. And in fact, to be frank, most other religious forms are very, very involved in the metaphysical, particularly if they involve spirits in their religion. And so you get a whole group of people on earth who are looked up to by others on earth, but in who, who in reality are often in quite dark conditions themselves and have attracted quite dark spirits to them and they have these quite dark experiences which they feel are quite powerful. And they are quite powerful in the sense that they are, they are powerful experiences emotionally, but uh, they're not powerful in the sense of love. And this is why, you know, a lot of times, you know, the experience of people who are connected to them are the same kind of experience you've had. And that is this experience of, yeah, I feel some spirit attacks occurring with my family. I can see there's some projections going on with my children and things like that. Things. And this is often done because these spirits use these metaphysical things to hook people in on earth into, into then investigating what you would call the occult. And then after the investigation of the occult, 
And because of the soul condition of the people and the soul condition of the spirits involved, some very negative things can eventually finish up occurring. That being said, some of those things are very powerful. And, and many times, the people who call themselves shamans are often addicted to the power of it, as was your pa previous partner. And, uh, and it's the addiction to the power of it that keeps them in the same condition and keeps them experiencing these experiences right until the de time of their death. Mm. And, uh, yeah, that really saddened me, actually, because when I'd watch your DVDs, he'd get so angry. <laughs> Um, yeah, anyway. Yeah, this, the spirits with him would be heavily influencing him to not watch anything that I would be presenting. And, and also, the spirits with him would also be heavily influencing him to prevent others from doing the same. And, uh, and in fact, almost any person who would call themselves a shaman would, would find it very, very difficult being present even in one of these groups for any extended period of time. And so um, the key to, to remember is that they're just a highly mediumistic person being influenced in the same way any other highly mediumistic person is being influenced. They allow that to develop and because of their addiction to power, the power that it gives them or the glory that it gives them or the feeling of control that it gives them in their life, they remain connected with these spirits for long periods of time and often until they pass. And even when they pass, they become one of those spirits influencing another person. Um, so often they stay in that state also in the spirit world for a long time. Mm. Would praying for someone like that help be helpful? Certainly. Praying for anyone is always helpful. So certainly your desire for anyone can change uh, their condition and even change their longings quite a lot. There's a lovely... Uh, uh, is it the life in the world unseen or is it... Um, there's a natural love document that I put... Sorry. There's a natural love one that I've put in the CDs um, that was ri written by... Yeah. What's that called? Is it, it's not life in the world unseen. <coughs> yeah, it's not that one. It's... It's this other one. Uh, I forget its name now anyway. Um, a, wander and it, it, a Wander in the Spirit Land. That's it. Um, what, uh, what happened? It's a, it's a really good channeled material worth reading. It's a, it, particularly the first uh, half to two-thirds of it. It describes the experience of a spirit in the spirit world who arrives in the hells. So he, he's actually not in very good condition when he's on earth and he arrives in the lower regions of the first sphere in the spirit world. And it describes the prayers of his soulmate on earth and how that affects his decisions and what things he does in the spirit world. And he was greatly assisted by his soulmate in the, on earth, who was alive on earth. So he had passed and he passed in the spirit world. His soulmate was alive on earth and she was praying for him fairly constantly <coughs> And she would often feel when he's about to make a poor decision <laughs> in the spirit world. And, and she would pray for him fervently at those times and he would feel drawn to her every time and it actually caused him to not make a lot of decisions that he probably would have made in the spirit world. It's a really good read in terms of understanding some of the relationships <coughs> between what's happening in the spirit world and what's happening on earth, particularly in the lower spheres at the lower regions of the first sphere. What was that called again, sorry? I think it's called uh, Life in the... W uh, sorry. A wanderer. A, a wanderer in the Spirit Lands. A wanderer. A wanderer in the y Spirit Is that lands. on your Divine Truth? That's um, on the CD. The CD? Yeah, it's on the CD under okay. Natural Love. <coughs> Natural Love PDFs, mm. you'll find it in there. There's a nice Judas message too on prayer. Um, there's plenty of Judas messages that are really worth reading about prayer and so <coughs> forth and the effect that it has on, on lots of on lots of different things. All right, can, can I ask just another sorry, one sorry, sorry. Um, about um, crying and and about crying, crying and processing emotion? Yep. Um, uh, if if <coughs> if if um, I'm processing emotion and don't access any tears, and am I actually 
processing that emotion, or is is am I um, is that an emotion of self-deception? It depends what emotion. <coughs> um, you see, like an emotion, for instance, of sexual shame may not involve tears, but you'll certainly feel waves of different feelings of sexual shame roll over you. If you've got an emotion of uh, like shame itself, that might not necessarily involve tears. So there, there are certainly emotions that don't involve tears, but, but grieving is the most powerful healing emotion. If you're having an emotion of sadness that doesn't involve tears, it's highly unlikely that you're processing the sadness. Or terror? Uh, terror, usually you'll be shaking. So you'll be physically shaking uh, if, you're, if you're processing terror. If you're living in terror, you might not be shaking. You might just be terrified about everything that's happening all around you at e every day. Mm -hmm. But when you actually process the terror, you physically go through this release process. And once the release process is complete, you'll find that you'll never go through it again. So, you know, your body releases terror that way. Just like, you know, you know how an animal, when it, like if, if uh, my father, when I was little, he sometimes took me out uh, rabbit hunting. And what he would do is he would shoot the gun over the top of the head of a rabbit, right? So it wouldn't actually, the bullet wouldn't penetrate the rabbit. But what would happen is that the sound barrier being, being um, broken over the top of the head of the rabbit would cause the rabbit just to go into this startled fright and it would just sit there and shake, yeah. right, like that. And you could actually go and just pick up the rabbit and slit its throat, right? So... Um, I'm not recommending it. <laughs> but, but what I'm illustrating is that there is this response in the human as well, the same kind of response of where we go into this terrified state which actually prevents us or freezes us from actually doing anything. And that is a terror state. And that some, some of you have experienced those states in your childhood, particularly if you had violent sexual abuse occur, for example. And those kind of states will probably need to be accessed and released in order for you to move beyond that terror. And so y some of you will go through those kind of emotions, but you may not be crying at the time. Okay, thank you. <coughs> oh, sorry, uh, this lady over here has been... Hi, I've got two questions. Far away. I was wondering if you can offer your perspective. I had an experience seven years ago where I kind of spontaneously went down onto the ground and had huge waves of energy coming through my body and yeah, beginning of sort of huge shift in my awareness of myself. I mean, I felt like since that moment I've been very connected emotionally or physically to myself where I wasn't before, but can mm. you offer any ideas about that? Well, um, I don't feel I need to because I feel you already knew what ha know what happened. Yeah, I want to hear you say it. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's deal with that emotionally. Why do you want to hear me say it? I want confirmation. Right. Now, what, now many of you do this with me, and I, I'm not going to give you confirmation emotionally. Okay. Right. Right. Second question. No, 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 let's go down to this emotionally first. What's up, what happens is you're not trusting yourself. Yeah. All right? And, and the issue of not trusting yourself is going to create many problems in your life. You need to learn to trust yourself. So these experiences that you have that you feel quite strongly about, but you often wonder about, you need to trust your own analysis of them. You need to allow yourself to start feeling about them. And you know what will happen in time is that every one of those feelings you will understand 100% what went on once you progress a certain direction. So I've had many experiences in my life where I would have loved to ask somebody else, what was that all about five years ago? And now I know exactly what it was all about, right? And I know for certain. And you know the same, right? And so you're not getting away with that. Right? So now we can have the next question. Okay. <laughs> Second question. My daughter is threatening suicide. Mm -hmm. So How old is your daughter? Fifteen. Yep. And... Yeah, I'm just wondering what's going on. Is that something in me that I'm, there's a part of me that, you know? Um, the emotions in her, or the, I should say the suppressed emotions that she's not releasing in herself, are certainly the creation of yourself and her, uh, and her father, right? So it's the amalgamation. It doesn't matter whether she lives with her father or not either. 
there's an amalgamation of those two sets of emotions that have entered her. And a person desires suicide for a number of reasons. The first reason is that they do not believe that they can actually, um, that, they, that they'll need to continue experiencing the same emotion when they pass. So in other words, they have this belief that if they die, that whatever they're experiencing emotionally right now will disappear automatically. Does that make sense? Escape. So they'll be able to escape the emotion that they're currently in. Now, that's not the truth. A person who commits suicide actually does not escape any emotions at all. And in fact, they have one additional emotion added to their list of emotions that they need to process, and that is the av avenue of taking their own life has its own law of compensation emotion attached to it. Now, so the first thing we need to do with any person who's contemplating suicide is to let them know, in fact, they're not going to escape their current emotional condition by suicide. Now, that in itself is a powerful thing to tell a person who's suiciding. I did that last week. Okay. Even if they do commit suicide after then, they will remember those words. All right? The next thing that suicide person is trying, uh, or the person who desires to suicide is trying to do, if they're sincere about their desire to suicide, is that they are trying to avoid emotion. The whole reason why we choose to take the ultimate step of removing ourselves from this world is because we're trying to avoid the emotions we're experiencing in this world. So, so we need to first look at we need to start encouraging a person who's contemplating suicide to look at why they want to avoid their emotions so much. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if we can help them come to see that it's actually a desire to avoid certain emotions and that they can actually get help to deal with those emotions, they won't actually need to feel like they need to die to get rid of the emotions. And of course we can continue to remind them that if they do die, they still won't get rid of the emotions anyway. The third thing that often a, suicide, a person who's contemplating suicide is doing, if they're telling us they're contemplating suicide, is they're actually trying to get an emotion satisfied within themselves of being recognised and wanting attention. And so this is a possibility. Usually a person who contemplates suicide, uh, who's really sincere about their contemplation of it, it's rare for them, although I'd recommend it, it's rare for them to talk to somebody about it. They usually just go ahead and do it. Um, the persons who talk about it first generally want either your commiseration or your agreement that it's the best way out, which of course, like I couldn't give. So um, look at also whether the person's, one of the emotions the person's looking for is this emotion that they just, just to be noticed. So they may just feel like totally unnoticed, totally unrecognised in their life. If that's the case, then that's the set of emotions that they need to allow themselves to experience rather than contemplating suicide. So sometimes contemplating suicide can be an excuse rather than an actual event, or it can be a deep desire driven by the desire to get away from my emotional experience. Either case, underlying causal emotion needs to be addressed. So a person would be best talking to some kind of psychologist, psychiatrist perhaps to start that process off if they feel challenged about doing it themselves or they would, you know, talking to the people that they're upset about or in some cases a, suicide pers a person who's contemplating suicide is doing it to contemplate punishing the people around them. So, you know, it'd be lovely for them to begin talking to the people around them about why they want to punish them and so forth. And then they start connecting to the emotions and that's always going to be the way out for them. Any person around you who's contemplating suicide, my suggestion is to always tell them if they do it, this will be the situation. But also, if they do it and they do pass, there's spirits there who are wanting to assist them just like you want to assist them here <coughs> on Earth. But they still will not be able to avoid the emotion of it in the end. The uh, What Dreams May Come movie, yeah. Because it does contain some depiction of reality there. That, you know, it's not all true, but it's a little distorted, but there is some depiction of reality of what happens to suicide, to suicide victims. It's not 
fully true because in the movie itself they portray suicide victims of never getting out of hell and that's not the case at all. You know, the, one of my friends, Judas, is in the celestial heavens and he hung himself. Uh, so, you know, that's not the case at all that a person can't progress from that state. Yep. Um, is there anyone that's in the new? We go. Oh, Linda's had her hand up for a long time. Oh, yeah, sure. Let's add to that then. You've got a microphone. We need microphone because the sound system now is wired so that it only gets what the person speaks through a microphone. Um, with the suicide with her daughter, you didn't mention um, once that it had come from her mother, that there's some causal emotion from her mother? Oh, I did say that right at the start. Did you? I yeah. didn't but yes, it yes. comes from, remember I said the emotions of mother and father. Um, so that needs to be looked at inside mum and father. So if that, that lady connected with that emotion that's causing her daughter to do that, mm -hmm. her daughter won't want to do it anymore? Not necessarily, because the daughter's 15 years of age. And when a person's at the age of starting to take self-responsibility for their life, they still may go ahead and do something that you as a parent have worked through an emotion about. Because they have free will choice, right? So it hasn't really come from the mother, possibly? No, no, it's come from mum and dad, the actual emotions. But usually it's emotions of wanting to punish people, you know, wanting to... There's a lot of rage inside of a person who's contemplating suicide, lots of anger. And it's very suppressed, but there's usually lots of anger there. And the key is to try and help them connect to that anger. You'll probably get what the anger's about, and the anger will be a lot about <laughs> what mum's done and what dad's done, and, or what mum hasn't done and what dad hasn't done. Um, and there'll be some emotions underneath that for them to work their way through, certainly. Yep. But, but even if you do all of that, she may still contemplate suicide because she has her own free will. go down here yep. and then across there just just the lady in pink there I just wanted to ask you both about emotions of self-deception um, I feel like I've processed a bit to do with my unworthiness I feel like as I think Helga pointed out yesterday about the aspects that I feel like I've gone through quite a few of them um, just one that I feel really stuck with in the last few weeks and I feel like I'm being hammered with law of attraction to do with um, not getting respect. Mm -hmm. That's the emotion that's coming up with me. Um, my son who's 14, the one giving it to me constantly. Okay, so it's not getting respect from a male. Yes. Yeah. And so <laughs> I'm just already, when you said that, it's like I've still got the dad issue. Spot on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's enlarge a little on it for you. Um, when you have law of attraction events occur, look at the gender that it occurs with as well, right? Because that can help you a lot. So if the law of attraction event is with women or with men or is it with both women and men? You know, uh, when I say women and men, if it's with the girl children that you have, boy children that you have, both, only, only the boys, only the girls, look at all of that as part of the law of attraction because it tells you a lot about what's needing to be dealt with. The issue is you, you're feeling like you're not getting respect. That's the feeling inside of you. So can you see how that might be related to your dad and some of the things that your dad's taught you about yourself? I kept going back through the ones I've already touched on and felt like I'd released mm -hmm. certain parts of it and thought, oh yeah, this one's <coughs> okay to do with my unworthiness again and from not being heard by Dad probably. Mm -hmm. And so I'd been trying to get past, but I just kept getting stuck on this one. Yeah, it keeps no, coming back you're actually, me. you're actually, unfortunately, on all of the emotions of self-deception and we'll talk about why. Um, how do you feel when you don't get respect? 
So f firstly, remember we said yesterday that if we have if we have a law of attraction event occurring over and over and over again, what does it mean? We're not accessing the causal emotion. Does that make sense? The law of attraction keeps on happening. We're not accessing the causal emotion. So, so you can be crying about different things that you believe are about unworthiness. You, this is what you said at the start. You believe they're about unworthiness. And yet, the law of attraction is not changing. You've still got your son treating you disrespectfully. So... There's got to be something else going on. So how do you feel about men? Um, I feel like um, I do everything for them mm -hmm. and I don't get anything back in return right. like respect. So how much anger is there, there about that? Yeah. Can you see you haven't let yourself process any of your anger about that at all? Yes. What you've done is you've concentrated on the unworthy feelings and the feelings that daddy's done this to me, but you're not actually seeing that inside of you there's this whole group of emotions where you're now projecting at men. Like, I'm doing things for you, you've got to do something in return, right? Which is actually not love either when you're even doing the thing for them. You follow me? Yes. And so in that process there's a lot of anger. And there's a lot of anger coming from you towards your son. And of course, he's going to respond with that because in his feelings, that's totally unfair. He doesn't deserve your anger. He wasn't the one who created it. Who created it? Mum and dad, something happening with them when your childhood created it and probably some, ma you know, some relationships in between, but certainly not your son. So he's getting this barrage of emotion, not that you're verbalising it all the time, but he's feeling it from you. He's getting this barrage of emotion from you and he's going to respond in a rebellious manner towards that emotion. So in reality, it's not about your unworthiness. Can you see what I'm saying? Can you see how easy it is to get caught up in taking it all on, oh, it's all me, it's all me, I'll just feel unworthy, when really we're skipping or we're distracting ourselves from the deeper pain. Well, there's anger on top of the pain for you, but underneath it there's all this pain about how I've been treated by men. So it's quite different to this unworthy feeling. Mm. Yeah. I kept thinking every time he throws this at me, oh, I'll just cry about it because it made me feel hurt. Of course. And so I'd cry about it and think, okay, well, I'll just keep crying every time it happens and then hopefully I'll be able to access if I keep praying to God as well. And But it wasn't happening. I keep no. It keeps coming. So if it keeps coming, remember one of the signs, it keeps coming, <coughs> I'm, not, I'm just deceiving myself that this is the real emotion. Right, so there's something else underneath there. And in fact, what you need to do is connect to some of the real strong projections that you've got going. And there's a law of compensation attached to that as well about these strong <coughs> projections you have at men based on you feel you can earn their love. Right? And the truth is love is a gift. It's, it's not something that you can earn ever. Um, so the belief that you can earn it came from your relationship with your father and also y your mother's beliefs about men as well and the combination of those two beliefs have entered you. And it's a matter of you connecting to that set of beliefs, which is not actually about unworthiness, but a whole different set of feelings. Thank you. Uh, who was next? You had someone. Should we go to Josh? Yep. And then... <laughs> and then we'll go next to I was just wondering, while you're talking about motions of self-deception, um, Maybe if you could give an example of when you've been processing some emotion that you felt was in avoidance of a cause, um, what using your free will, what is it like? Um, how can you jump from that into the cause so you can really deal with what what's causing that? Yeah, no worries, Josh. Um, I'll give you one that happened about a year ago. Um, it was during a time myself and Mary came back from an overseas trip, and the day we came back, Mary's parents sort of grabbed hold of Mary and whisked her off away from me, um, trying to sort of get her away from me. And Mary felt like she wanted to as well, get away from me, didn't you? So that was very helpful for you. And so, um, <laughs> had someone to blame for that. Sort of thing. <coughs> and then um, we went through this um, process where I saw Mary a week later, but it was under very strange circumstances. Her family started starting to attack me and so forth. 
and be quite angry with me and so forth. And then Mary felt very drawn into not so much agreeing with them, but certainly not feeling like she could say openly what she felt. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so by two weeks later, um, we were not together. So after we got back, two weeks later, we were not together. Then I went through all of these, uh, a whole group of emotions. Firstly, I was upset about what had happened, like parents meddling in my life. <laughs> Then I went through a whole, which was all, these, are why, these by the way I'm listening now, here all self-deception emotions. Um, then I went through an emotion of, uh, you know, feeling like Mary didn't want me and all of those kind of things. And that one took me um, quite a lot of, I, I spent uh, probably, I don't know, six weeks or seven weeks of that. Uh, again, uh, like I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a crybaby, so, uh, so about six hours a day crying for seven weeks. Um, and I was really distraught, like just because, like, feel this total feel these overwhelming feelings for Mary, and there's no contact between us at all at this stage. And and then uh, I started realizing because of the degree of anger that was in my crying, and because of the degree of anger that I felt towards Mary, and anger to towards the family, and all those kind of things, that actually I was in just this total place of self-deception. And what I had to do then was start connecting with the underlying emotions that were creating it. And they were underlying emotions like that I'm not attractive. I, you know, I'm not sexually attractive. I'm not uh, worthy to be with Mary. And, you know, lots of different emotions like that. So I started connecting with a lot of those emotions. And they all were beliefs about myself that I've had all my life mm -hmm. that I managed to release through that process over a period of the next three or four weeks. And... And once I'd worked my way through those emotions, three days later, Mary contacted me. So up until all that time, Mary didn't contact me. So my law of attraction was, yeah, rejection, you know, keep me away while I'm dealing with, while I'm actually in this self-deception phase, not getting rid of the causal emotions. A few days after I felt like I'd dealt with the causal emotion, I actually felt quite strongly that Mary would contact me. And within two days or so, Mary contacted me. So, like that time period where you're processing the um, deception emotions, where what was your relationship with God? In that? Would you I, I was praying still every day. Um, obviously, not receiving much divine love through the whole process. Um, feeling in a really upset and confused state. Um, finding it very, very difficult to understand why I couldn't get beyond it. I tried for a period of time. I tried giving up Mary in my heart. Um, as well, like I just tried to like uh, allow her to move on with her life sort of thing and, and I tried to deceive myself like that, that I'd done that as well for a few weeks and none of that worked of course and eventually I got to the underlying cause of emotion. But why was that period of emotion there for you? Like if you went to God, wouldn't you be able to skip over all of that? I wasn't listening to God. Like, so you just didn't want it to Yeah, it's God. like, you know, you can pray to God all you like but if you're not listening to the answers, <laughs> you, you're not going to get anywhere really. And the trouble is most of us are praying for something totally different. So what I was actually praying for was that I be with Mary, uh, firstly, and then know that, that I gave that up after a while. And then I was, I will release her from my heart. Well, I didn't want to do that, so I wasn't being honest. <laughs> do you know what I mean? There was so much dishonesty in myself in the different sets of emotions that <coughs> I went through. And then I went through, you know, blaming the parents for influencing her and then I w eventually got to the state of forgiving them for that and, and you know, working through that emotion. And, and, you know, once I worked through a lot of these type of emotions, now I can start hearing, ah, actually, yeah, this is all about me. This is all about the emotions that I have unhealed in myself about myself, right? And once I started connecting with those emotions, I had some very, very distressing times but I could feel divine love during those distressing times. So I can remember one of the times I was curled up in a fetal position for seven hours crying, but I was feeling divine love all that time, <coughs> just releasing stuff about soulmate loss and soulmate grief and all that kind of stuff that I've experienced. So once I went through that, I could, and I'm, see, so again, if you're feeling divine love, even when it's happening, you know you're dealing with causal emotion. If you're not feeling it while it's happening, then you know you're probably in a self-deceiving emotion or a capping emotion. And so, so by the end, I got, you know, and when I say the end, 
the last week was productive. So in some instances, it's it, you need to go through this self-deceptive self state yeah, like well, to I get there, like to have the want to do it. If I had someone uh, next to me saying, actually, AJ, you're just deceiving yourself there, I think it would have helped me greatly. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, a lot of the times you don't observe yourself that clearly when you're in these emotions, and so you don't notice that you're deceiving yourself. But th there were times that I noticed I was deceiving myself. So when I went outside with the axe, you know, chopping down trees, <laughs> and, and I was angry, I, like, I, was, uh, I knew I was deceiving myself then. And I would keep saying to myself, well, you know, this is not productive, this is not productive, I'm not doing a productive thing here. But just, do, just releasing the anger, still trying to release the anger and get underneath what, what that was. But at the end of the day, if, if I'd been told what it was at the beginning, I might have been able to, I'm not sure, but I might have been able to connect with the real causal emotion, which was all of this stuff about myself. And, I've, and in fact, as soon as I started saying that to myself, I straight away connected with the emotion. So I guess what I'm trying to ask is, like, throughout that whole process, you had the ability to go to the cause, yep. but you just kept saying... But I kept avoiding because the causes were even more painful than what I was experiencing. And, and I was also had periods of time during that time of blaming someone external to myself rather than actually seeing that the, information, the, the emotion is inside of myself. So I had, I had a periods of time where I felt upset with Mary for not treating me truthfully and, and so forth. Then I had periods of time with her parents for treating me in the way they treated me when, you know, before then they were fine with me. And so, so I went through different emotions there. But once I, once I got out of that and into this state of starting to really focus on how I felt about myself, and I, so what I started seeing was, that for instance, Mary's parents were just reflecting to me how I felt about myself. Because if I didn't feel this way about myself, I wouldn't be agreeing with them at the soul level. Does that make sense? So my anger even was showing that I actually agreed with them at the soul level. So, so when they were saying to me that I was no good, like, I felt I'm no good. And that's why it hurt me for them to say it. Does that make sense? And once I started understanding that, and, wh and, and when Mary, you know, Mary had told me just before we, we left that I, she found me very unattractive. <laughs> right? Don't go, that's, that's a projection. Thank you, you projection. <laughs> Mary told me she found me very unattractive, right? And, and I started, instead of blaming Mary for finding her soulmate unattractive, what I did was I went into this emotion that I realised now, ah, you know, like, that's because I find me very unattractive and it hurts me when somebody says that to me. Does that make sense? And so once I started connecting to that, <coughs> I started releasing that. Now I was in the real emotion, the, the real causal emotion. And uh, once I connected to that, it was much quicker for me to process than spending weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, you know, in this other state. So I guess it's like for a period that y y y it's like being without water and then that creates the desire more to connect with so that you can have that relationship again with God. Yeah, that's right, Josh. It's like... Um, like I feel it quite severely when I don't have a connection with God now and when I haven't had a connection for seven or eight weeks I'm starting to get really distressed right and for that period of time I wasn't receiving any divine love and f felt quite disconnected from every everybody including myself and so um, you know I was feeling really quite distressed and I think I actually mentioned that when I was at one of the groups how distressed I was feeling about about you know that emotion and so it, it taught me a lot, though, about how to get into the emotion. And it also taught me a lot about um, a lot of times we're, when we're projecting an emotion of blame at someone else, what's actually going on is actually we, what they've said about us is something we really do feel about ourselves. And, and once we connect with that and release that, we'll actually not feel it about ourselves. And that person could come up and say it to us again. And we go, no worries, you know, like, that's fine, you're allowed to believe that, but it doesn't affect me at all. So I've had periods now where, like, somebody comes up and they're all upset with me or something, and I don't respond in any, in any of the same way as I responded before, because the emotion's not in me anymore to resonate with what they're saying to me. 
And so if you allow yourself to see that with a lot of the emotions, every time you experience sort of an anger-based emotion, a lot of the times it's because what the person's saying to you, you actually believe inside of yourself to be true about yourself. The instant you don't believe it, which is when you, re you release the emotion as to why you believed it, which might be related to a childhood event or some, you know, usually is related to some childhood event or something, once you get out of that and, and feel that emotion and release it, a person can say the same thing to you and you say, no, that's fine. Like, so you'll get to a state where, you, where somebody can say to you, you're totally unattractive, man. Like, you're the most ugly man I've ever met. <laughs> And you say... Which I didn't say. Let's no, no, that's right. not what you said. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you could then say, no worries, that's all right. Like, that's not how I feel about myself. I think I'm pretty good. <laughs> you know, and it won't affect you at all. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I might as well ask while I've got the mic. Um, I was going to ask Mary about how... Like, I've noticed that she's changed quite a lot in the last couple of weeks or, couple, like, last period. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to know, like, because I spoke to Mary um, when I first came along to one of these things, and I got this feeling that you know there was these truths that she'd really figured out, and then there were some things that she was doubtful about and things. And I've seen that she's changed in that. Um, I just wanted to know, like, how real is this whole thing to you now? Like, this whole thing <laughs> being like <laughs> taken away by the cult leader and everything. <laughs> It's a pretty wild trip. <laughs> no, it's really real, Josh. It feels really amazing at the moment. I think um, lots of people have commented to me. I'm a bit, a bit high on the truth at the moment. You know, it's really resonating with me, and heaps of um, emotions are coming up, and I feel like w this whole self-deception thing is a big turning point for me um, to really s feel the process of starting to clear some emotions. Yeah, and I feel like. Um, I've started to have a relationship with God again and that's just beautiful. And I feel so passionate about talking to everyone about the truth, you know. I just think it's just a blessed sort of opportunity that we have at the moment to be doing this, all of this, all of us together. Yeah, so. Yeah. Oh, it's great because I just, that yeah, I just wanted to see that that confidence about there being a God and things, because I've had um, instances where I'm like, this is so real, everything that you're talking about. Mm. Uh -huh. And um, it's good because I've, I know, knew you before <laughs> this confidence about the whole thing, and now, you know, I just wanted to illustrate that, I guess. Yeah. Cheers, Josh. Thanks for that. Next to you, Josh. How, c <coughs> how come I don't have dreams, or if I do, I don't remember them? <laughs> um, I, I'm not really a good person to answer that question because uh, most of the time I don't have dreams or I don't remember them either. <laughs> so I'm not abnormal or not missing out? Well, I suppose there's a lot of theories about dreaming and not dreaming, but um, I find when I go to sleep, I just black out completely. And when I wake up, I'm here again. And... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there doesn't seem to be much happening in between. <laughs> I've been told by some mediums that I've asked the question by, to some mediums uh, when I've visited them occasionally, and and uh, the answer's always been that if I knew what I was doing in my sleep state, I'd get so freaked out. So it's probably better off I don't know at this point. <laughs> so that might be the case for yourself too, that you might be a bit freaked out by some of the things that are happening in your sleep state. And uh, and feel quite like resistive to remembering them. Mm. I know that's what I, my emotion is that I'm quite resistive to remembering my sleep state experiences. I'm not resistive to remembering my dreams, uh, but I'm but I am resistive to remembering sleep state experiences. Um, who's, who we got? Yep, yourself, yep. AJ, is it okay to deviate for a moment away from emotions? Sure, if you want to. This is my first time in your presence. Yeah. The only other teaching I've had is from all the um, DVDs on YouTube. Yep. 
And from one of those I picked up uh, your explanation as to why you chose to reincarnate rather than to materialise. Yes. Christians for centuries and centuries have believed that Jesus would come down in the clouds wearing a big white robe yep. and would materialise in that way. And as I was driving here today, I had the Christian channel, radio channel on, and yep. there was actually a song about that very thing. That very thing, yeah. Would you be kind enough to comment on the fact that you are here and how that relates to the second coming? Yep, sure. Thank you. I haven't finished yet with the second coming either. Um, it's probably could be a very naive question on my part. Perhaps yep. everyone else in the room knows the answer to no, that. No, no. But um, to me, it's a really important one. Okay. Yeah. yeah f firstly, um, I've got my robe hidden in my wardrobe. <laughs> But, but the Apostle John told me that if he ever sees me in a white robe again, <laughs> he's going to leave me for good. So, <laughs> so um, a lot of what's a lot of what's written in the Bible is um, is analogies about different events, uh, even in my life about my life in the first century, let alone now. But that event that you describe is is going to be an actual event. But, and we'll but an event in the future. So will you announce yourself <laughs> in some special... <laughs> <laughs> Just don't say anything else. <laughs> I'll leave it hanging like that. <laughs> so further down the track, will you announce yourself to the world in some way that you are not able to do right now? Yes. Is that where it's at? Yes. Um, the process I'm going through right now is this process of, of which is a really one of the essential processes and one of the essential reasons why myself, Mary and the others of the 14 are here. And that is to demonstrate to the world how to get from a condition of sin into a condition of one And if we don't do it ourselves, it's, it's like uh, coming to you, telling you how to do something and we're already there glowing in the glory of it. Do you know what I mean? That obviously wouldn't be very helpful emotionally to the whole human race. So, so our focus is, is living, living like walking the walk with you. Yeah. And so our focus, uh, all of the 14's focus was to actually come to the earth and unteach a lot of untruths. Mm. Um, there were so many untruths about me in the first century, so many untruths about the path as well delivered you know, from the result of the first century experience and we wanted to unteach most of those things including the the whole concept that I was God's unique son uh, you know part of a holy trinity and all of those type of concepts which were all quite damaging concepts to the truth in the sense that what what they did was they they put myself while in a condition of atonement in a certain condition and then basically said to the rest of humanity you can never reach that condition right which is the opposite thing of what I was teaching to people on earth. In fact, if you look at a lot of the Bible record, you look at, say, John 17 and other books of the Bible like that, you, you will see that the record was I wanted man to be at one with me and at one with God like I was at one with God. So quite clearly I was stating the truth even then that I was not any different to any other man or woman mm. living on earth. But unfortunately, there were so many distortions and everything of truth. By the time the third or fourth century came around, there were so many distortions that m a lot of the basic truths that I taught, which is this basic truth of the principle of the new birth, this process of becoming at one with God and how it happens, and also the basic principles of natural love and what's going on in the spirit world and all those kind of things were all highly distorted. And as a result, that sort of left, and, and, and it left a desire in us, those of us in the spirit world at the time, to come back and return and actually teach the truth, mm. you know, in its full glory, if you like, to mankind so the truth wouldn't be lost. Now, we didn't discover a way to do that um, until we, we could all materialise all the way through that period of time. And there were many times between the first century and now that I personally and others of the 14 who have returned have materialised on earth and done things. Um, but all very ineffective when it comes to dealing with people's emotions and helping people understand the basic truths of becoming at one with God. 
So, so there were really only a few options of how to return. Uh, one of the options was to materialise a body, um, which would be like a perfect body um, that uh, didn't have to do any transformation, doesn't go through any transformation, and we all of a sudden just do exactly the things that we could have done in the 20-second sphere, demonstrating the truths of the spirit of the, the universe, the spirit connections, and these different multi-dimensional spaces, and the 20, the 20, the 22 dimensions of existence, and so forth. We could have demonstrated all of that, and we would have lost most people by the time we got to the third sphere, right? In terms of all of those things, because there'd be no one who could actually connect emotionally to what we were even going through, or feeling, or thinking, or and they would also feel like we couldn't connect to them for the same reason. So the other option was actually to return, be born, actually born onto the earth again and go through this process of transformation. And, uh, and so that's what we strongly felt God wanted us to do. Uh, and also we could see the huge benefits of that, which are unteaching all of these untruths and actually reteaching the divine truth to humanity and then demonstrating it through you being able to examine our lives as we progress to the point of at one minute which would actually give you great faith and encouragement that you would personally be able to do that yourself. So you're setting everyone that example and showing them the way. Yep. So uh, if I would to tell my Christian friends <laughs> yep. that I had met Jesus today, yep. One of the questions that I'm sure they would ask is, if I were to pass over tomorrow, uh, I've always believed that I would be in the presence of all the arms of. Uh, and he's down here. Exactly. Uh, right. It's going to be a bit, <laughs> it's be a bit hard. Um, How do you answer that one? Yeah, the truth is that uh, the whole Christian belief that as soon as you pass, you sort of get into the state of being at the right hand of God in the arms of Jesus is all very false. It disclaims most of the truths that I taught in the first century, actually, because in the first century, I taught a lot about the condition of the soul of the person and where they would go as a result of their condition. And then I talked about the principles of the soul and how the soul's condition is grown or destroyed by what the person chooses to do. And this is why I gave all of these illustrations about, you know, that so-called the discussions of the Sermon on the Mount and so forth. They're all to do with natural love, a lot of natural love principles as well as divine love principles demonstrating how the soul of a person becomes developed. And I also used a lot of the illustrations and a lot of the illustrations all were aimed towards demonstrating how the heart of a person was involved in the process of transformation. So it wasn't just your set of beliefs that caused you to arrive in the spirit world in a certain location. It was actually what was really going on inside of your soul, what, what was really the emotions inside of your soul that caused you to arrive in a certain location. And so there's a lot of truths in the Bible which I could explain to you if, if, to a group of Christians, and I'm sure in the future there'll be many occasions where I'll be doing that. Um, explaining to them what I really meant when I, when I told them those things and even whether I said them or not because there are obviously a lot of them I never actually said. But in that process, I illustrated the soul and its law of attraction and demonstrated how the soul's law of attraction actually caused, the, through the soul condition, the result of where you go in the spirit world. Uh, are you versed in the Bible at all? You, you can remember the illustration of the rich man and Lazarus? Do you ever? Yep. You remember how I said how there were ones from past times who had passed over and they were in condition, you know, in, in a beautiful condition in the spirit world? And then I described the rich man who used to feed what he would normally feed his dogs. He would give to Lazarus, the man who was full of ulcers and sores that he would never even look after and he'd look down upon. And then when they died, their conditions were reversed. Do you remember that illustration? And that illustration, I was trying to demonstrate how what God sees in us is totally different to what man sees in us. And you remember another time I said that many saying to me, Lord, Lord, would not enter the kingdom of the heavens, but only the ones doing the will of my Father would. So what I meant by that was that the ones who were focused on the will 
Oh, in other words, finding out God's laws about, and, and the will of the Father is always about love. So those living in love would be the people who I would connect with, not the people who thought they were living in love and they said, we were doing it, we were doing it, but in reality it hadn't hit their heart. You see what I'm saying? Well, it comes back to the heart, doesn't it? Exactly. <laughs> so, so the real purpose of us coming again too is also to illustrate this vital truth and that is the heart your heart or your soul condition determines the location of where you will arrive in the spirit world. And this is something that most Christians don't understand. And the reason why they don't understand it is because they want to believe that the instant they pass, all of their sins at that moment, because they believed in my blood, have been cleared. And of course that's an impossibility because I can never take responsibility for another person's sins or another person's disharmonious actions disharmonious with love so I can never take responsibility for them so of course all of these things were untruths that the priesthood taught the people in order for the people to become dependent upon the priesthood so so in the end what's happened is there's all these untruths about myself all these untruths about our life all these untruths about how I lived my life all now prevalent on the earth that all need to be undone as part of this process of people understanding the truth and the best way to achieve that is for you to observe a transformation of a man going through this transformation into at one moment and a woman going through this transformation into at one moment and when you see that occurring before you, you will start actually having and generating a desire within yourself to actually start doing the same thing. Well the second coming has always been related to um, prophecy and Certainly. Uh, so much is going on in our time that so many people are saying it must be imminent. Uh, which leads me to my final question, which is about earth changes. Mm -hmm. uh, I did say in the blurb today that you might comment on that, and I'm just wondering if it's not too late for you to, to do that. Um, I gave a talk about a few weeks ago on earth changes, okay. and to be frank, I don't feel I need to discuss it too, fr too deeply. That's fine. That's there will be coming earth changes. Um, and of course that's all part of this process of mankind coming to an awareness of their own condition. Mm -hmm. um, and of course the timing of our return is very much related to the timing of these earth changes for significant reasons. Mm -hmm. And some of those reasons are to assist mankind through this transformation period into change. <coughs> but that being said, there are still two paths. There are still two paths you can go by. And the, fir the first pass is what I discussed in the first century is the broad road that most people take. I didn't say it was to destruction, mm -hmm. but I said it, w it was a broad path that led to the sixth sphere. It led to the perfect natural man. Then I said there was this narrow path, this narrow way that led to life, to, to everlasting life. Mm -hmm. And what I was talking about was life in eternal or infinite life, infinite changes. And that I called that a narrow way to that life and what I'm describing to you now is that narrow way, the way through the new birth or one moment with God and so forth. It's a narrow way because there's only one way to do it, <laughs> right? Whereas the broad way has like thousands, hundreds of thousands of ways to do it and that road to the sixth sphere is like got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of paths to it and any one of you in any state can get to that place at any time using any one of those paths. But the actual way to God's kingdom, which I referred to in the first century and now, this place in the spirit world and also this place inside of you that happens, and that's why I said the kingdom of God is in your midst, because I was standing in front of people demonstrating what they would feel like when they were in the kingdom of God. And that was in this state of at one moment with God. And I was demonstrating that to them right there in front of them on earth. And that's what we're here to demonstrate with this narrow way and there's only the one way to it and it's the way that I'm describing to you. Thank you so much for explaining all that. No I'm worries. very excited to know that the second coming is coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, the second coming is here. <laughs> exactly. but, um, but in terms of the way that there's prophecies in the Bible relating to the second coming, of course, many of those prophecies actually occurred after they were portrayed to have been written in the Bible. So there's been many, many spirits who have been involved in this prophecy of truth 
given to earth over the last 2,000 years, some of which made it its way into the Bible and other of which made its way into lots of different sorts of writings right the way through to modern times like Alice Bailey's writings and so forth, all relating to the return of the Christ as, the, as, the, as it was, would be said. And all of these prophecies all relate to this time period and the return of initially the 14 of us who return in order to reteach these truths. So it's not just me reteaching these truths, it will be 14, the 14 of, of those who have returned teaching these truths. Obviously they're all in different conditions at the moment, all working through different things at the moment and all in various dif disbelief at their, own, at their own identities at the moment, aside from Mary and a few, a few of the others. So, so, but that process will be worked through as well and that will be a part of these truths that come about. And they are the only 14 people, or you are the part of the only 14 people who have reincarnated, is that correct? No. No? No, there have since been others who have reincarnated after the 14 have reincarnated. But, but the others won't have, as, as you could say, as much of a role in this process. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So what about um, Buddhists, for instance, who believe that they've been reincarnated many, many, many times? That's an untruth. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And so uh, there, there are many reasons why they believe that, uh, by the way, and most of it's to do with spirit attachments and what's happened to them when they're on the earth. M most of those spirits, by the way, who used to believe it, now in the sixth sphere still believe in reincarnation because, in fact, we've, the 14 have demonstrated there is reincarnation, but there is only one way for that reincarnation to occur. And so what we're also demonstrating to a lot of the faiths that don't believe in Christianity and, in fact, in the, when I say Christianity, I'm not talking about true Christianity, the one that I taught. I'm talking about the one that's been modified, which I would call the imposter Christianity, if you like, that, that, uh, you know, that only Christians can do this or only Christians can do that. That's not true either, obviously. But there's a lot of uh, Buddhists who, who used to believe in the spirit world that reincarnation was not possible. So they reached the sixth sphere, tried to reincarnate, couldn't do it, felt it wasn't possible, and then in 1962, when it did occur, it was well known in the spirit world it was going to occur, and did occur, and so now this is why in the last 40 years and 50 years that there's been a heavy, uh, you know, very much stronger teaching that reincarnation is a truth. It's just that the majority of the spirits involved in the teaching of that don't understand how it works still, because they personally have not experienced it. Thank you so much. No worries. Um, Kim? Thank you. Um, my question is more related to the self-deception um, yep. topic. Um, yep. Victimisation. Um, I think that's one of the major self-deceptions we have, that we are victims. Yep. I think it's a very um, powerful lie that we fool ourselves with. Yep. Um, I'm just wondering, though, in your view, do you ever see that we actually truly are victims? Are children victims, <coughs> for example? And at what point does responsibility um, kick in that we are, you know, that we're not victims? You know, is there ever a time that we are? Yes. But please, firstly, be aware that I'm not. I'm not saying that if we have that victim emotion, <coughs> that it's not a causal emotion, because for many of us, we do have an emotion that we were a victim of some crime perpetrated against us, when, particularly when we were children but even as a, adults, that where somebody else chose to exercise their unloving emotions and chose to actually harm us purposefully, right? So many times we then become the victim of the crime, if you like. Now, I'm not saying, th I'm not talking about those sets of emotions when I'm saying becoming a victim, and that's why I use the word victim in quotations. Some of us are addicted to remaining victims. The reason why we love to remain victims is because we get a lot of attention that way. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like if you're the victim and you can tell your story and, and, and people, you know, connect to that story, you can do a lot of things, can't you? You can, you, you can get money from them, you can get their attention, you can get their help, you know, and this is what happens a lot is that we're taught how to you know, be the victim in order to get something in return. And that's the kind of self-deception emotion that I'm talking about. So many of us, when we were children or during our life, 
we have been the victim of a crime of some kind. Any crime, anything that affects our free will is a crime from God's perspective. So anything that affects our free will obviously means that we are now a victim of a crime. But if we remain in the victim motion, we are not going to get to the causal emotion, which is this deep grief that we often feel inside of ourselves or, our, or a number of other different types of emotions. And my suggestion is to get out of the victim mode and into the into the grieving mode about what happened. The victim mode just perpetrates the, the neediness that, of what we want from others, whereas the grieving emotion actually releases something from within ourselves. So I'm not suggesting that we don't allow ourselves at some point to see that we have been a victim of a crime. So for example, many of you have had, have had childhood sexual abuse in your life. You were a victim of a crime that was perpetrated against you by some spirits and people that those spirits manipulated <coughs> into harming you. <coughs> and that happened to you. And, it, and I'm not saying to you that that's not a sad thing because it's a very sad thing when any single person on this planet has had their free will affected in such a way. But what I am saying is if you stay in the state of telling the story about it, rather than connecting to the emotion that you feel about it, you will never release it. And you can choose to do that for the next 30 years if you want, and in 30 years' time you'll be in exactly the same state you are now, with exactly the same law of attraction, if you choose to remain in the victim mode telling the story, but not actually feeling the underlying emotions of the story. Do you see the difference, Kim? Like, I do. Yeah. I do, and I think that for me the word vulnerability comes into play, whereas moving from being feeling, believing you're a victim to allowing yourself to be vulnerable yeah. to really reach what's under that. That's right. Allowing yourself to be vulnerable to your own emotion of what happened. Yeah. That's correct, yeah. I have one more question. I struggle a lot. I have a very blurred um, feeling around this. If I'm feeling attacked by somebody through rudeness, um, withdrawal, um, this sort of punishing behaviour that feels, it obviously resonates with me because my childhood I have an emotional reaction to that. Yep. Um, at what point do I, not blame myself, but okay, at what point do I, how much of it do I need to own and how much of it do I need to say, no, wait a minute, you are behaving badly and that's hurtful behaviour and that's not okay and I need to remove myself from that. You know, w w how much of it is theirs? How much of it is mine? Um, do I need to put in place boundaries? And and is the loving thing to do to stay with that? And or remove that's a myself lot of questions. That? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I said it's blurred. So yeah. Let's try to answer some of those for you. Um, firstly, because there's a law of attraction, everything that happens to you happens because of your soul condition. So this is true. That doesn't, though, justify poor behaviour of others. So in other words, I can't say to you, oh, Klaus, you know, you've got this problem with the men in your life and actually it's going to help you a lot if I verbally abuse you and then I just go ahead and verbally abuse him. Does that make sense? Why isn't that good? Because I am actually not being loving. Right? That's me, I would need to own that emotion. However, if Klaus, through his law of attraction, had a man verbally abusing him, and that man doesn't own his emotion, Klaus can't change him. But Klaus can actually change his own emotion that attracted him. So that's where Klaus needs to own his emotion that attracted the event. So what needs to happen is I need to own my own emotion that attracts the event. So in the event of being attacked, I certainly have an emotion inside of myself about that. I have an emotion that needs to be worked through. So what I generally do first is release that emotion about the attack. So, you know, it may be all sorts of things connected to that one event, all sorts of childhood events that I allow myself to experience. What happens straight after, after you've dealt with those emotions, is that you no longer attract attacking people. So before you might have got 25 people attacking you all the time or 10 people attacking you all the time or men only attacking you all the time or women only attacking you all the time or older women only attacking you all the time. It just depends what the emotion is, of course, that's triggered because it's all different. 
and I work through that emotion inside of myself and all of a sudden all of those older women will treat me better. Right? They haven't changed. So what's changed? I have. So my emotions inside of myself have changed what I'm attracting. Now, once I own that and feel that, I will get to a state where I will no longer allow attacks, either intellectually or emotionally. Now, if I find I'm always having to repel attacks, then I haven't yet dealt with it emotionally. But if I find that I generally don't have any attack in my life and only, it, it only occasionally happens, and it only happens when I tell the truth, for example, then I might have another emotion to deal with. And that might, emotion might be that I have a feeling that if I tell people the truth, they'll hurt, hurt me. And that might need to be dealt with now. Does that make sense? And then when I deal with that, I start telling the truth and all of a sudden people are listening to me instead of attacking me. <laughs> right? And so it shows to me that my law of attraction has changed again. But there is times in, the, in your progression where you will meet a person who brings this emotion to your fore. So in other words, they attack you, they attack you, they attack you, and eventually you connect to the underlying causal emotion. And you feel the underlying causal emotion, and all the other people who are attacking you all stop attacking you, but this one person keeps attacking you. Now, under those circumstances, it's highly unlikely now that it's to do with an event inside of yourself. Does that make sense? That it's now highly likely that this person just wants to keep doing what they were doing before then. And all you need to do is talk to them about it. And if they want to keep doing it, you say, I'm sorry, I just don't want to be in your life. But you won't feel angry about it yourself. Does that make sense? You won't feel like all distressed and all terrible about having to do that. You will just feel like it's a natural thing to do. You won't feel like you're having to repel the attack. Does that make sense? Yeah. So now what I'm finding myself is somebody can attack me and, I, and I'm just there, like, fair enough. <laughs> like, but, but before when somebody attacked me, I'd go home and cry for a few days <laughs> about it, right? Because I'd feel really upset. But now I don't feel that upset when somebody does. So when somebody yells, the only person that now can yell and scream at me and actually get me to cry is, is Mary. <laughs> right, so so I've, got, I've got a few emotions about my soulmate doing it, obviously, still. But... Um, Aside from that, you know, it's very rare for somebody else to be in that state and actually, and actually it's very rare now for anybody to even do that with me. You'd think I'm saying I'm Jesus to people, you'd think I'd get a lot of attacks, but actually recently I've hardly got any at all. So, except just people telling me that I'm not Jesus and I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. So, so, I suppose what I'm trying to illustrate to you is if you're having to repel attack after attack, then there is something inside of yourself yet to be healed. And the key is to go into that and, and allow that is. And you know what it might be? Mm. And I feel it's some, a, a little slant for you to look at. Mm. It might, be, might not be actually about, um, you know, the feeling that you have about being attacked, or like uh, this is unjust and uh, wrong and all that. It's not probably about that. There's, if you look at who's attacking you, you'll see there's a specific law of attraction and when you do that, you'll see what it's all about. Do you follow me? No, I don't. <laughs> no? Well, over the next few weeks, if you have any attacks upon you, like verbal attacks or whatever, look at who, the, the gender, right, the age, everything. Look at, look at what's going on as to who's doing it. Oh, and yeah. I know who's doing it. It's repeatedly, it's my partner. Yeah. Yeah, but, but if you look at it, it's not just your partner. There's other things going on too, and you need to be honest about it. But if you see who does it, it will actually help you a lot to examine what's going on at the childhood level. So look for a pattern? Or yeah, there'll be a pattern there. Okay, thank yeah. you. I'm saying to you actually, Kim, there is a pattern there that you're not seeing. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay. It's actually half past five, guys. Yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, we need to have another question and answer session at some point. What, what we've decided to do is have one a month. The reason why we've decided to have one a month is, is one of, a little part of the reason is self-preservation. <laughs> because we're getting so many questions that in the end um, we can't answer them. And, and many of you come up to ask questions about different things in the break about your own lives. And my feelings are now that I feel like I need a rest in the breaks. 
So if you can honour that, that would be really lovely. And also, if, if you guys could be brave enough to ask your questions in the sessions, a lot of the questions you ask would really benefit a lot of other people. So, so, so the emotion that you'll need to confront to do that is your fear about public exposure <laughs> and your fear about getting a microphone in front of you and so forth. So hopefully you can deal with all of those. Um, but we'd like to thank you very much again. We'll be seeing you again about a month's time. I think it's the 18th and 19th here. So uh, we'll see you then. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, everyone.